how do you not have an agent or a manager, but I'm meeting with you? Like, how is this happening right now? How did you go from making no budget movies to raising 165,000 ish for clowning? Yeah. So clowning came about in a very interesting way. The horror film we're going to be going into here soon, that picture we were in the process of building out, talking to different producers, executive, um, executive producers for the horror film and casting directors. And as we started to build that project, I, I became more detached from it because the current producers that were there at that moment, they were going around and talking to investors, but they weren't bringing me to those meetings. So out of a desperation to continue creating, I wrote clowning. And then in the midst of that horror film, I needed to find an entertainment attorney because these contracts were going to start coming from these investors for the horror film. And I needed to be prepared because who knows what those were going to say. And obviously you just have to have an, an, an entertainment attorney. So at that time, living in West Hollywood, I realized calling entertainment attorneys around LA was going to be much more expensive. Most people want you to put down 20 grand or a larger retainer on them to come into a feature film. And, and so, so we didn't have that kind of capital laying around to get an entertainment attorney that way. So I called my uncle who works in international tax consulting and just asked him about getting an entertainment attorney. So he told me he would call. He, he's in Atlanta. So he contacted a bunch of different attorneys and he gave me the name of an individual named Kelly Fry. And I called Kelly and we had a conversation and Kelly informed me that not only was he an entertainment attorney, but he was also an executive producer. But his executive producing hat was tapped. So he'll read the script. At that point, I had just finished writing Clowning and he asked me what I was writing. I told him about clowning. He said he'd love to read it. So I sent him clowning. And he told me also he was 20000 as an entertainment attorney. But he was willing to take five up front and get the rest out of the budget. So there was a part of it I was like, okay, well, this is the best deal we've gotten so far. So I sent him clown clowning to give it a read. And that was on a Friday. And on Sunday, I get an email from him. Now, you wouldn't expect an entertainment attorney to be emailing you on the weekend. So I get this email, and he said it was one of the best scripts he's ever read. He waived his $20,000 entertainment fee uh, and also said that he wanted to be the executive producer of it and wanted to take a stab at finding the financing. From that point, we end up getting into a couple of different meetings with other financiers. At one point, we had financiers who came to the table with 250000 but they wanted me to replace my lead, Jonathan Gaeta, who's my producing partner. So I didn't want to replace Jonathan because clowning's based on his life, our love of our friendship, and also we love working together. And it was his film, his story, really truly to make with him. So I told him, no, I wasn't going to, you know, for no matter how much money, I'm not going to replace John. So we, so he started to try to walk away from the table and I kept him on the phone and I said, listen, I can make this money. I can make this movie for any amount of money. You know, you find me $50,000 and I'll make this movie happen. So he's like, all right, let me talk to a couple other financiers. And then within a month, he was able to pull together 165,000 and we were off to the races with Jonathan starring part of the, 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 the part of the actual deal we struck up was me cutting 20 pages out of the script. He was like, you either cut 20 pages out of the script or replace Jonathan. And so I was like, I'll cut the pages, which really thank goodness, because we needed to cut even more pages than that. As you find out when you get into your editing process and cutting the movie from 115 minutes down to 92 minutes. Was it, were, were the, tw the, the, were they consecutive 20 pages or there were different parts where they didn't? Oh, like different parts. Uh, oh, just different parts that I, I chose to, to remove. And, you know, this, this, my journey into this is very interesting because I've had a ton of freedom. So we got these investors um, that brought the money. They, they invest in movies often and all very wealthy individuals. And when they invested it, I was already signed on to be a producer, writer, director, editor, sound designer. And then eventually I mixed the film too, but under a pseudo name. 
Um, but what that gave me, for better or worse, is having so much freedom on the process. The crazy thing here was we had a 120-page screenplay. The money wasn't quite enough to do the film, so we ended up having to shoot that material in 17 days. So we shot 120 pages over 17 days. It was supposed to be 18, but one of the days got burnt out by the fire because there were fires that October. And so we had to cancel one of our days of shooting. So clowning was such a treacherous undertaking because it's not a one location film. It's got around 30 to 40 locations throughout the whole picture. There's 60 or so actors in the piece. Um, it's jumping from different time periods. And so it was very complicated with a lot of makeup changes uh, to do this thing in 17 days. But I feel like coming through clowning and using that resources, using the budget to, to make that picture, it really helped me figure out the final steps of making a movie with a big team. Because one of the questions they asked me on set was, where do you like to have your monitor? And at that time, I didn't have a direct answer because I had made all these movies with the camera on my shoulder. So where would I want to have a monitor? Well, now I know I want to create a massive amount of separation. So I want to have a handheld monitor in the future, be next to the camera and the actors, and I want the producing monitor, the monitor for everybody else, to be in a completely different space, far away. And I want to try to create this realm where no one knows when we cut. I'm kind of segueing into what I want to do in the future but going back to clowning and getting that budget, it was the first time I ever was given money for something I wrote. And as we know in the history of cinema, that's how it used to work constantly. As you'd write something so good, they'd give you some money and you'd go out and try to see what you can do with it. So I was so thankful that it came about that way. And it was a crazy, crazy journey because the, uh, you know, then we go into COVID and we're in post-production. And so luckily I'm editing and doing all the sound design myself with a little four track audio recorder out there getting all the different sounds. And uh, so throughout most of COVID, I was finishing clowning myself and having these private screenings with me and some of the main collaborators. And then our executive producer, um, he just wasn't as much involved in the selling of the movie. So me and my producing partner had to figure out how to get the thing out there and built our own sales package and contacted Gravitas Ventures and was able to get the thing sold. So now coming off of clowning and paying the taxes every year, because one thing people don't realize is when you create that LLC, every year you got to pay taxes on it. And that could be $1,300 depending on how many K1s you have to have made for all your investors. So it's like every time you make an indie film that you want to make money on, it's an actual company that you're spending money on every year. So then the, the then suddenly we're in the middle of a pandemic and the movie, I have to finish it myself so we can get it out there because now we owe these people. My sister's house, a really nice house in Columbus, Ohio, is $150,000. So we spent more than my sister's house on this movie. And like now we're in the middle of a pandemic where... People are saying the movie industry is shifting and changing. and But luckily the movie came out March 15th and it's on Blu-ray and Best Buy and Walmart and a bunch of different places. So it's really uh, exciting to see that go out there. And so much came from that. And for me, clowning demystified the whole getting money from investors and selling movies. It's very much now just such a business and makes sense in how it works. But... So from just your uh, uncle contacting or, or getting you some numbers of entertainment attorneys. Yeah. And this individual wasn't even here in L.A. No, Tennessee. Wow. And then what some of the investors story. are in New York. Other investors are in Florida. And then the gentleman saw the, or read the script over the weekend. Yeah. And said, not only do, you know, I'm going to lower my retainer or whatever and take, take some of the money. He waived market. his fees completely for just wow. points. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that's great. And then, and then a, a friend of mine who became our casting director used his agent and his manager to start contacting name actors like Mike Starr and Bronson Pinchot and people like that. I met Bronson in a meeting, and he loved the script. Said that it was he hadn't read something that great since True Romance. I don't know if he really meant that fully, but regardless, I took it and it felt really great to hear that. Um, but I love true romance. And I don't think that necessarily, but anyways, um, 
I sat down with Bronson and he's like, how do you not have an agent or a manager, but I'm meeting with you? Like, how is this happening right now? And it's just such a unique moment where the truth is, I came down from San Francisco to Los Angeles. I found an independent rental house and I went to this rental house. I was in the middle of a Hollywood production center. Are you familiar with those where, 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 where you can rent little spaces for writing rooms and stuff like that? Yeah. So, so, so I went to a Hollywood production center and talked to this individual who owned his own rental house and convinced them to hire me. And then in the production, Hollywood Production Center, I went around to every single room and met everybody in the building I could. And then I called all the clients in this rental house and I called each one and I would pretend like we're missing a lens and I would segue into conversations. And before I knew it, I was first AD on a little TV show that was at, uh, for a couple of weeks from doing that. And then I met almost every person that worked on clowning with me came through the rental house. And then my friend who used his agent manager to cast the thing with me uh, had his own um, selfie tapes business inside of the Hollywood Production Center and we would use their lobby and we would use their rooms to do casting for free. So the clowning was built and it looked like it had a budget early on, but for a couple months we were prepping the thing and had no clue where the money was gonna come from. And I think that's a big testament to the whole scenario. And here's a really scary story. Early on, we knew the money was coming. We hadn't gotten the money yet, but we knew that we had confirmation it was coming. We had casted Bronson, Mike Starr, Dashiell Connery, Nana Ghana, and a couple of other actors all SAG. And I suddenly get an email from the SAG office in LA and they email me and no one knows this actually. This is something only a couple of close people knows this, but now that it's out and it's over and it's all great, I can say it, but I got an email and they tried to shut down our production. They emailed me out of nowhere and said, you're officially a non-SAG movie. It's come to our attention. You've already filmed the movie and you're backtracking to try to become SAG so that you can sell this movie. We hadn't shot a single frame. What happened is I had posted on my Instagram. Now I worked at the rental company I mentioned. And there was a moment where my, the owner of the rental company came to me and said, he just bought an Alexa Mini and some Cook anamorphic lenses. And he said, go out for the weekend and do some test shoots with the equipment. So I filmed my friend dressed as a clown because I was writing clowning. This is before we even got the money. Oh, oh, oh no, no, this is after we got the money because we had people locked. Or, or no, this is before we got the money because we were just filming um, when we actually did the test shoot. And, and so I post this still frame of him dressed as a clown and then SAG won't take my call because I'm trying to explain to them that that's not from our movie and that they're just positive because they went through my Instagram. So I decided, I, I got on their website, I found every single SAG email I could find and I wrote the most passionate email just you know, talking about how I was a fourth generation from a family that's a fourth generation paper mill working family, Hamilton, Ohio. It, you know, it's against all odds that I would even be in Hollywood, let alone be giving six figures to make my first you know, movie with a budget. And I wrote this passionate email and I emailed it to like 70 people at the SAG building, including some of the people that run SAG. And then I got this email back said, for you know, just this once we'll, we'll make this SAG. And from now on, make sure that you never breach any of our rules again. Since then, I've done a couple of SAG movies and they've been really lovely, but that was terrifying. <laughs> is that, is even shooting a little like just practice, like teaser trailer or something, would that constitute going into production? Yes. So it does. Okay. as soon as you're, if you're in Los Angeles and you're trying to make a movie and you have any actor that's SAG at all, then you have to contact them and let them know what you're doing. If you want to do a read through, if you want to have a meeting where an actor's already signed on to your project just to talk, all of those things they could flag and say that you're not, you have to be. So, but, but on the other side of the fence though, I get it because actors deserve to be paid for sure. working. And Absolutely. so that's what they're trying to protect, um, which was crazy for our picture. I had so many SAG actors, they told me I paid all of our actors even better than any other production at our level because I wanted to make sure that people are being paid well and almost our whole production was, most of our money went to actors. Another big thing that you don't know going into making an indie film at a quarter million dollar budget is that SAG's gonna take a deposit. So they took $14,000 as a deposit 
from us, which is not something you contemplate in your budget with 165 available. So we were almost $14,000 at the end of the budget, at the end of the shoot, at the end of the 17 days, we were like almost exactly $14,000 over budget, but we had to come up with that money ourselves because they won't return that budget until a month or two after you're finished shooting. And so you have to deliver that via cashier's check or how, how does that get Oh uh, no, that to was them? wired. It's wired to yeah. them and you have how many days to get that to them? Like once they find out you, you're going into production, when is that paid? Well, the deposit side of it, you know, once you're totally sealed and you have your actors and then you send them your final paperwork that says what each actor is being paid, then they do a percentage of what the amount is you're going to owe actors. And then they, that percentage is what they ask you for the deposit. And then I think that has to be given to them a week or two before you go into filming. I believe. I can't quite recall the exact timing. And then it's held thereabouts. Until a month or two after you wrap. Wow. Yeah, which is where like I had to put a loan on my car and some other things to just make sure because I mean some of our lead production heads needed their checks. Well, and sure, like yeah. and like for me, that's more important than anything to make sure people are paid for their great work. Uh, luckily the loan on my car is already paid off and gone. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. It was but uh but it was a really stressful moment coming off that movie and being like, Well, we gotta come up with fourteen thousand dollars to get people situated. But but also I've heard now, now that I've talked to a lot of people that have done quarter million dollar features, apparently it's very normal to go thirty to forty thousand dollars over budget on a movie like that. So I don't think we really even hardly went over budget at all when it really comes down to it. So you have those expenses plus you're paying on this LLC. Yes. That and do you close out the LLC once the no. movie is distributed? It's forever something you're going to be It's going to be a company. For, for, in, for in perpetuity. So yeah. It's never until, going until it's, uh, I guess, and then you would dissolve it later if it stopped making money. Okay. But, the, but like right now we have a 10 year deal with Gravitas Ventures. So, so that movie will be out there for 10 years. And as that 10 years is going on, I got to keep the bank account alive, got to keep the LLC alive, um, all those things. So then the money can come through and everybody can get paid. But you can see how quickly if you made multiple independent films and you're trying to create those vessels in which you could make money that they could drain your bank account very fast. If you have a couple of those and you're making no money. Sure, but you said if you were making no money, you could theoretically dissolve yeah. the LLC, but then yeah. that would cut off all chances of... Ever making something from that project. Right, so you have to yeah. decide, okay, is my film making no money? Do I cut my losses or do I hold out hope? Interesting. Wow. Yeah. And wow. then, I mean, at the same about. time, I mean, now you have investors. You have people who have really given you money, their personal money from their bank accounts. So, you know, obviously I walk into this with a very honest mindset and my main goal is to get them back their money. So, I mean, that's one reason why we, I mean, we had never sold a movie before going into clowning. So going into clowning, we really had to teach ourselves how to make a sales package because a lot of people go to sales representatives to get their movie off into the world, but a sales representative is going to take a percentage on top of the distributor. And I've heard horror stories where you'll never see a penny. So for us, it was like, well, what are they doing that we can't do? And then we built the sales package and luckily got it out to Gravitas. But I mean, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it really also depends on who's the lead of your movie too. Because unfortunately, you do need to have some kind of name that people are familiar with to help them want to go see it. I mean, if you want to make movies and put them in AMCs, which I would like to do. And so with Bronson Pinchot, did you watch Perfect Strangers growing up? Oh yeah, most definitely. My favorite Bronson performance that really melted into my mind's eye, like April 23rd, 2006 was when I decided to start making films. Well, probably a few years later, I discovered the movie True Romance. And I watched that a billion times. So when I met Bronson the first time and he came in and talked about true romance, my mind is like, whoa, I can't believe this is, you know, like right. eight, ten years later, suddenly we're talking about this. Uh, but Bronson's unbelievable. I wrote a particular psychological thriller for him to star in. Hmm. And I'm hoping that we do that soon. Um, he's gotten into an incredible health and just 
a great physical place. But you know, he's he's the hands down best improvisationalist right. I've ever seen. I mean, just from the show, I don't know how much of that was improv of his character, but hilarious. Oh, he's so intelligent, so yeah. funny, and uh, mm. and and really is hungry to perform. Like if somebody's looking for a great actor out there, Bronson Pinchot is 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 really just hungry to keep going. Did he stop acting for a while? For a little while there, he did. He was renovating houses. That's what for I think fun. I remember. Yeah, yeah. He he got into a, he he has a passion to renovate houses and to redo things like that himself with his own hands. He'll send me pictures sometimes of uh, his own little rooms that he was doing during the pandemic. Or somewhere in upstate New York. I think I saw some. Yeah, place. and then he had a little reality show or something. Okay, maybe right? that's where I saw it. Yeah. And they like were following him a little bit while he was choosing wow. houses and like choosing how to uh, renovate them. But oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah, but he's doing a lot of acting now. He's Very definitely back. Cool. Yeah.